You may have heard of her and her ambisextrous antics, drinking champagne out of a shoe, saying, Daddy warned me about men and booze, but he never said a word about women and cocaine, and her regret at failing to seduce Greta Garbo. Other people might have heard of her, you know, as a famous actress. That too, but I'm quite certain her antics have overshadowed everything. In fact, content warning for exhibitionism, sexual assault, and alcoholism. And before we get to the shenanigans, we start in Alabama in January 1903, though some frequently state her birth date as February 1902. The younger daughter of a politician, Tallulah's unusual name would foreshadow her unconventional personality. Unfortunately for her, her mother died of blood poisoning only days after the birth, and her father spent a fair few years blaming Tallulah for the death. For a time, she and her sister lived with their maternal grandparents, while their father ran through money on booze and women before pulling himself together. The fact our protagonist was tomboyish and prone to illness didn't help. That sounds like a great childhood. According to her autobiography, she had measles, pneumonia, mumps, whooping cough, erysipelas, smallpox, and tonsillitis as a child. Tallulah's multiple illnesses might have been the source of her distinctive voice through damaging her vocal cords. Another reason might be that during the operation to remove her tonsils, the doctor slipped a bit and damaged the cords. As to the tomboyishness, she'd fall down laughing if you tickled her, and also threw tantrums so strong that her grandmother threw buckets of water over her head. Wow. So when you say tomboyishness, it's it's more not conforming to the, the sense of female gentility. She was very much not a Southern Belle. This was also terrible in a society that advocated avoiding conspicuousness, but it's thought this was mainly caused by a lack of parental attention. Eventually, Tallulah had to be educated, and it was decided that she would be sent to a Catholic boarding school. She did not get on well there. The strict structure was not to her liking, and one of the nuns immediately decided her name was too pagan-sounding and announced such in front of everyone else. Off to a good start there. <laughs> she also hated being forced to bathe while wearing a nightshirt as Tallulah had never been ashamed of her body. She was also reprimanded for standing in front of her mirror naked and preening at her appearance. Her father was eventually called for a discussion over her behavior. He assumed she was just too restricted being inside all the time, so he took her and her sister to the theater. It had the opposite effect. Tallulah became even more dramatic and got expelled after flashing the gardener. Oh, so when we said uh, content warning for exhibitionism, that's starting to show up. Both girls were then sent to a new private boarding school while their father embarked on his first political campaign and abandoned marinating in liquor. I wonder how that's going to go with her starting to act like this. It didn't go well. Jealous of her sister getting a part in a school show, Tallulah got drunk on rough cider and turned cartwheels in the auditorium. And then at age 12, she fell in love with a nun, and nothing came of it, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. That would have been just one more thing to add on top of all of that acting out. About the same time, her father remarried without informing anyone. Excuse me? Initially, Tallulah got on well with her stepmother. Then she was separated from her sister and sent to another new school on the belief that time away from everyone else would improve her. It did not. Instead, she snuck out to watch Ala Nazimova perform in War Brides and immediately had a new crush. I, I love that we have multiple like crossovers where it's like, saw the other perform. Weeks later, her father sent her older sister to the same school with instructions to keep an eye on Tallulah, who was now emulating Nazimova. This is not to say that her sister was the perfect counterpoint to her wildness as said sister, would thrice marry the same unsuitable man after multiple interventions from their father before the marriages were consummated, thereby pushing forward annulments for the first two times. What is this, a sitcom? Like, that is just bonkers. 
anything in history can be turned into a TV show if enough people read about it. Here we are, putting it on blast. You just want me to write it. Yes, I do. In the meantime, teenage Tallulah discovered the early Hollywood magazines and won an extra role in a picture. Thus began her acting career at the end of World War I. Though it started on the stage and tended to alternate plays with films. Now, her aunt chaperoned her, but Tallulah could wiggle out of her aunt's grip. Hence the time she spent an afternoon posing semi-nude for publicity shots. How old was she at the time? About 16. She also slept with the photographer, though she maintained that she was technically a virgin till age 20. I mean, like, I get it. You you do have a sexuality as a young person and especially as a teenager, but like adults around you should not be engaging with it. You know, it's gross. It is indeed. And soon enough, Tallulah got her wish of no chaperone when her aunt left to join the Red Cross in Europe and Tallulah became a fixture at the Algonquin Hotel. Oh, albeit as a sort of pet of the older actresses by entertaining antics during play runs. Many of these plays were not good. One did quite well, though, and brought hordes of admirers to her dressing room where she gave out advice while holding their hands. Wait, Tallulah gave out the advice? Yes. I cannot speak to how good the advice was. But I'm sure it felt like a triumph to her to be... You know, here she'd been a pet all this time, and finally she has some semblance of authority. And attention. Mm Mm-hmm. It is also during this time that she had an affair with the actress Eva Le Gallien, who was three years older and far more experienced in both acting and life. That said, Tallulah would respond to friends' comments about it with, Oh, for God's sake, she's been writing me letters every day. I could never be a lesbian because they have no sense of humor. (laughs) One of the silliest stereotypes about lesbians that I've ever heard. And yet, she'd find many through the decades whose sense of humor she found acceptable, all while continuing to very publicly pursue men to squash lesbian rumors. That might explain why Tallulah later hid in the bathroom when writer Jane Bowles insisted she'd be perfect for the lesbian role in the translated work no exit. Which, by the way, great play. Would recommend reading it. It's you can find it for free online pretty easily. It's it's like the good place. Um, but if you want to just be miserable, that doesn't sound like a ringing endorsement. Yeah, no, the <laughs> the lesbian in that uh, mixed representation, we shall say. Anyway, after the New York play and Le Gallienne. Tallulah was offered a role in England on the basis of her impersonations of Ethel Barrymore at parties. I love this logic. It's like, well, if she can impersonate a great actress, then... And the logic followed that a 19-year-old, who is practically an independent, but still legally a minor until 21, finds herself as the star in a Gerald de Maurier play and fell in with the 1920s bright young things, who were even more outrageous than she was at the time. Which sounds like she was kind of hard to beat. For instance, they tended to have sex in cars or up against trees in Hyde Park while their friends watched. Sounds like she would like that. Oh, she took to them instantly and they to her. Soon Tallulah believed she was getting all the wrong roles, and decided to retire for a while. How old is she? I think max 22. Mm Mm-hmm. Retire. However, she couldn't just disappear from local gossip, as she tended to walk around her house naked and receive guests while taking a bath. Her public behavior was not much better. She'd accost acquaintances at brunch with the question, What's the matter, darling? Don't you recognize me with my clothes on? This woman, what is uh Theories mainly center on a lack of parental attention and affection as a toddler. You know, fair enough. It sounds like she needs a lot of attention right now, doesn't it? Now, she is forced to pull herself together a bit when a letter arrived about her father and a political colleague arriving in England soon. Eager to show she was indeed a lady, 
Tallulah immediately got a new role to ensure that her father didn't find her unemployed when he arrived. She also briefly banished her friends from her house during the visit. Her father didn't see the play or the dreadful reviews. But he did witness her impeccable impersonation of the French actress Sarah Bernhardt. This just sounds like a comedy. I mean, you can see this movie, right? All of her friends hiding in weird places and, you know, everything about to go wrong. And somehow, miraculously, he doesn't encounter any of the problems. All the naked people hiding in the closet. (laughs) Right, playing sardines. Just put it on the list of things you want me to write, Pixie. (laughs) Now... There was a role Tallulah desperately wanted, but she didn't get it. On the other hand, she got offered a role by a desperate Noel Coward a week before this other play's opening night. He asked her if she could learn over a hundred sides, which is to say pages, in four days. She said she could learn it in four hours for a hundred pounds. When he protested that the rate was double what was offered for the original play and part she wanted, Balula responded, The difference, darling, is that I wanted to play in rain. I don't give a shit whether I appear in your play or not. (laughs) Wow. She got the new role with the original opening night deadline. She got the last laugh, too. Because this new play ran longer than the one she'd wanted and been declined for. Instead, when that play, titled Rain, opened, it bombed. And what's the play that she's in? Fallen Angels. Now that just sounds like exactly the type of play that she'd be in. Well, she did complain about being typecast. Now, she does also start improvising from line changes to cartwheels for comedic effect, In addition, Tallulah decided that spreading a rumor about having an abortion and it not being her first would be a great help to her image and career. All right, then. So turning up the scandal. An adherent to the belief that any publicity was good publicity. And I will say that it worked in terms of advertising the plays she was in, though I doubt anyone cared about the plot at that point. No, you'd go for the scandal. The scandalous behavior didn't stop at self-promotion. This was the age of cross-dressing parties, which many of the old crowd, like actress Ethel Barrymore, disapproved of, and which Tallulah threw herself into at full force. Unsurprising. There were also multiple boyfriends whom she appears to have alternated parties with. On the business side, there was once a near riot in 1926 over one play that reviewers called oppressive and disgusting as there was a strong lesbian theme and the heroine had a tendency to strip down to her lingerie whenever the mood struck her. So how much of that was in the script and how much of that was just Tallulah? I think the stripping down whenever the mood struck her was Tallulah. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm sensing a theme. This sort of thing was becoming a common occurrence as Tallulah's fame rose. At one point, it was said 1,500 young women waited in the street for her outside the theater. According to reports, there were 12 arrests, several faintings, and one heart attack during this debacle. Just don't get hysteria like you used to. She also got engaged to a supposed Count Anthony de Bizdari, an Italian businessman who claimed to be a cousin of the King of Italy. And yes, Italy had a king until 1946. Now you're using some weaselly language here. Uh, What's up with this count? We shall see. The wedding was arranged for December 22, 1928. However, a possibly jealous lover and friend exposed the count as a charlatan. He was living on credit had never seen Italy until three years prior, was already married to a Chicago industrial heiress, and was grifting to Lula since she'd given him gifts, like a Rolex watch. Wow. (laughs) Needless to say, the wedding was called off, and she threw the whole man out the window. Mm Mm-hmm. You go, girl. It was also at this time that she made noise about running for office after the wedding, 
but that also never came to fruition. Tallulah would have been running against either her father or her uncle. I don't think she'd have done well, not only because women's suffrage was only about a decade old, but also because of all the gossip about her. I don't know. I grew up with the governator. Anything can happen. The first woman to run for political office involved advocating for polygamy, and that was before women had the right to vote. That did not go well. Afterwards, circa 1930, Alice Roosevelt, daughter of Teddy Roosevelt, was nearly the vice president, but backed out. So if even from a much more prestigious political line and much cleaner, though known for speaking her mind and doing less scandalous antics, if even Alice couldn't do it, I don't think Tallulah could have. All right. Well, I would have voted for her. Yes, she's much better than many of the current candidates. Now, some months after this Bozdari incident, there was another scandal. Her latest boyfriend went to go visit his younger brother and brother's friend at Eton. He took them out for the day to a restaurant, though he didn't get the school's permission to do so. And now, the press spun this as the two 14-year-old boys were taken on a sexual adventure by Tallulah. It became a whole deal with a press storm for two weeks, the headmaster making a public official apology for some reason, and the occasional audience member at her shows yelling child molester when she came on stage. Oof. And this time she hasn't even done anything. It still shook her badly, though she didn't show it. She went on a nationwide tour of the UK in 1929, but she was starting to tire of England. Tallulah compensated for this by seeing shows and reading books like Radcliffe Hall's The Well of Loneliness, a classic of sapphic literature that is seen by many as badly written, including Tallulah, who called it ridiculous crap. Also, if you want to hear more about The Well of Loneliness and the person who inspired a lot of it, then check out our episode on Tupi Lothar. Yes, she's considered to be one, if not the, inspiration behind the character and story. Now, Tallulah's mood was not helped by the realization that British playwrights didn't want her, because she now symbolized an American invasion of the London stage. So, in 1931, she moved back to the U.S., She moved into a suite off Park Avenue, where she threw money in large tips at all the wait staff. While there, she got a contract at Paramount for five films. I don't know what the thinking was, because this woman did not know the meaning of secrecy or discretion. Tallulah promptly outed director George Cukor as a gay man. Really, Tallulah? It's one thing to be open about yourself, but like... Naturally, the two didn't get along on set though he did support her adventures into Harlem to learn how actual blues songs were to be sung, rather than sticking to what was given in a script. Reviews of the first film, Tarnished Lady, were middling. As one reviewer put it, she proves to be an ordinary young actress, suggesting mostly a feeble resemblance to the more beautiful and able ones, especially to Miss Dietrich. She fails in the end to establish any sort of identity of her own. Tallulah herself called the film a patched-together mess. This was followed by the year 1932, which was a disaster for the entire film industry due to the deepening of the Depression. Still, Tallulah's shenanigans continued. When director Joseph von Sternberg walked off a set over a disagreement with the studio head and took Dietrich with him, Tallulah's friend became the new director and suggested that she get Dietrich's role. Tallulah's response was, Well, darling, I always did want to get into Marlena's pants. Oh, don't we all? This was followed by a chat with a reporter who mentioned Marlena put gold dust in her hair. Tallulah took it one further. So what? Now I'll have to start sprinkling gold dust in my pubic hair. She did not get Dietrich's role. And I imagine the studio breathed a brief sigh of relief before dealing with her next antics. Though I suspect Marlena was calmer about Tallulah's antics than the studio. 
considering they were out at the same nightclub or bar one night, passing a silver platter and messages back and forth with a waiter, Tallulah complimented Dietrich's gloves. Marlena then sent them on the silver platter to Tallulah, who then said she'd send her underwear back to Dietrich if she'd been wearing any. Oh, old-fashioned sexting. Now, Tallulah wanted to go back to the stage, but as we've seen in several episodes, the Depression was an even worse time for Broadway than it was for Hollywood. Instead, she stayed and did a film for MGM, during which time Will Hayes demanded MGM drop her due to the I Want a Man interview. An interview that has a name. What went down in this? Well, specifically, she said, I haven't had an affair for six months. Six months! Too long. If there's anything the matter with me now, it's certainly not Hollywood or Hollywood's state of mind. The matter with me is, I want a man. Six months is a long, long time. I want a man. (laughs) All right. Miraculously, MGM did not drop her after this interview. They simply issued her a warning based on the morality clause in her contract, to which she responded by saying, I have followed Mr. Hayes' advice and have taken up a completely sexless, nun-like, legs-crossed existence. Mm Mm-hmm, right. Of course, she said this while she had a new boyfriend somewhere as abouts, and Hayes still put her down in his black book for verbal moral turpitude. Of course he has that book. In this case, the film, Faithless, was a success despite some changed lines and a changed ending. Tallulah then demanded a pay raise. She didn't get it. She just got kept on the roster at her current rate. This didn't satisfy her. So she marched into Louis B. Mayer's office at the top of MGM's hierarchy. He got pissed off. She retaliated by spitting out the names of six top actresses and claimed to have had affairs with them. Then she threatened to expose them to the press. Oh, so that's kind of what she was doing with Cucor, but um, this sounds like it's more about the threat rather than the outing. In the end, Mayer gave up and Tallulah left Hollywood for New York with $250,000. So that worked. One could say this was to the relief of both parties considering her antics and dislike of being controlled by the studio. She decided to now go on Broadway with a spicy comedy. No investors would touch her because she didn't have a good string of Broadway hits already, so she financed the production herself. The preview opening in Boston was a mess with her fans chanting into a noisy maelstrom that drowned out the other actor's lines and the orchestra. The actor playing the groom opposite Tallulah got pelted with coins, orange peels, and women's underwear during the scene where his character leaves hers at the altar. It sold out theaters in Boston and Washington, but not in New York. In order to break even financially, she sold the film rights of the production to MGM. Now, she did not return to Hollywood. Instead, she spent the rest of the Depression on the stage and dabbling in radio. This is not to say that Tallulah didn't want to return to Hollywood eventually. She did. In fact, she was heartbroken when Vivian Lee got the role of Scarlett O'Hara in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind. She was convinced that she could have drawn the cheers of Beauregard and Robert E. Lee had she been permitted to wrestle with Rhett Butler, the character opposite Scarlet, for those unaware. Still, Tallulah had worse problems as the world hurtled towards World War II. Her father was starting to question why she was reluctant to marry. After two heart attacks, he was eager to walk her down the aisle and have kids before he dropped dead, rather like how Natalie Barney's father wanted to see her married before he died. Tallulah's sister was not much better than her. She was on a husband six with no kids in sight. This meant pinning his vision of a genetic future on the wildly promiscuous and scandalous Tallulah. I can't think of a worse ambition on his part, and I don't think anyone told him she'd had four abortions and a hysterectomy by age 31 in 1933. Oh, so she was not giving him grandchildren. (laughs) 
Odd fact, though. She both acknowledged that she'd be a terrible mother and regretted never having children. Still, it is in this atmosphere that she meets the actor John Emery. They were quickly engaged and then married. The honeymoon that followed sounds like a farce. They flew by small plane and handsome pilot, and Tallulah couldn't contain herself after dealing with horrible weather and an excess of bourbon. She attempted to have sex with Emery in front of the others. When the pilot complained, she took off her clothes, revealed she wore no underwear, hoisted herself up by the roof straps, wrapped her legs round his neck, and demanded he perform cunnilingus. Okay, Tallulah, that's not cool. The pilot nearly crashed the plane. Mm Mm-hmm. Someone managed to get Tallulah's pants back on her, and when the plane landed, a thoroughly stunned Emery was caught unawares when Tallulah pulled his pants down in front of everyone and commented, How's about that for a two-hander, darlings? Not a great way to start a marriage with sexual assault left and right. Yeah, I can see this marriage ending quickly and in divorce, and I don't blame Emery for it. Many of her friends thought the same. By the start of 1940, they basically went their separate ways, though the divorce would be in 1941 after her father had died of a ruptured artery while giving a political speech. And now there's World War II. At this point, Tallulah, like many in Hollywood, took up entertaining the troops. I imagine they would have appreciated her exhibitionism a bit more than the unsuspecting pilot. In fact, some of them made her an honorary second lieutenant in the 22nd Coast Artillery. She also went about raising money for the war effort through ads about war bonds and getting involved with the USO alongside the likes of Marlena Dietrich. It is also during the war that she returns to Hollywood and films. As a result, Tallulah would be awarded the Screen Critics Award for Best Actress of the Year in 1944 for her role in Albert Hitchcock's Lifeboat. Her next role was nearly given to Greta Garbo, who made noise about coming out of retirement after her last film, a disastrously received comedy, but Garbo never did return. So Tallulah got the part. Tallulah continued on in films after World War II and then added TV roles to her credits list as well. But she was still very much the same Tallulah Bankhead. She still partied till dawn and spent time playing cards while waiting in the wings for her cues in stage productions. There was also the time she bailed the singer Billie Holiday out of jail by pulling strings writing to J. Edgar Hoover in the Justice Department and secretly paying the other woman's bail. Now, did she know Billie Holiday? Was she a really big fan? They were friends and occasional lovers. She'd go on to rescue Billie several more times till the singer's death in 1959. Of course, she was also smoking more than ever before at up to 150 cigarettes a day and downing two bottles of bourbon to wash away the taste. There was also the trial against her maid, who was accused of stealing $10,000 from Tallulah. Well, the trial was a shit show for both. Tons of stuff came out about Tallulah's drinking, sex life, cocaine, marijuana, and other drugs. It also turns out her maid was a burlesque dancer and stripper first, and had indeed been messing with Tallulah's checks. So just all around mudslinging and dragging. I'll bet the press ate that up. In the 50s, Tallulah started a cabaret show and toured the U.S. and the U.K. Funnily enough, the club in London initially tried to get Garbo instead, but she turned them down, saying the stage was so close to the audience that they could look up her nose. Oh, that would not be a problem for Tallulah. In fact, Tallulah wasn't phased at all and said, if they pay me the same as they were going to pay Garbo, they can look up anything I've got. See, this is a a much better place for for her particular tendencies. And by now she had a predominantly gay audience who packed the club during the six-week engagement, but Tallulah thought of it as a one-off for the money, and she returned to New York after that. Critics continued to dislike her, but she entranced fans 
by capering across the stage without underwear and telling risque jokes. Tallulah continued to live up right through to the end, though she did compromise by decreasing her cigarette and alcohol intake as time went on. Still, she never quit either. In 1968, she caught the avian flu that was making the rounds of New York City, and it turned into pneumonia by the time she reached the hospital. At first, she seemed fine. There were reports of her yelling at the doctors and complaining about the service. The next day, Tallulah took a turn for the worse. She'd been put on a ventilator as her breathing began to fail. She hated it and tried to pull the tube out before falling into a coma from which she never woke up. When she died on December 12, 1968, her last audible words were codeine bourbon. After her death, her sister gave permission for an autopsy. Astonishingly, Tallulah's liver had been hardly affected by a half-century of constant bourbon imbibing. Her lungs, on the other hand, were mostly ravaged, though a doctor claimed they could have recovered if she'd only given up smoking. Her funeral was a few days later in Kent County, Maryland, where she'd stayed with her sister. Tallulah often commented, I don't care what they say about me after I'm dead, so long as they say something. So how about this? Overall, I get the feeling Tallulah Bankhead would have fit right in with the YouTube vloggers and TikTok stars, and would have even one up them on outrageous stunts. In fact, there's quite a few quotes and antics I've cut, because I think YouTube would throw a fit with what could be thrown in this episode. Yeah, I think that might be her problem is is all of the content restrictions and probably she would have been canceled for that thing in the airplane. That hasn't stopped several YouTubers from going on to be boxers and who knows what else. No, that's true. That doesn't always stop your success. Thanks for watching. If you want to know more about women from this era, particularly the sapphic ones, follow us on your favorite podcatcher or subscribe to us on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or on Twitter or wherever we post in the future where we post memes and jokes about your favorite dead women. And remember, if you're not cut out for Southern gentility, there's always the theater. <laughs>